Almost before there was anything else on the face of the earth, there were bugs. And while they may be small, there's no question that bugs and insects have had a huge impact on mankind. For most of recent memory, they've been content to behave themselves and fulfill their assigned roles in the ecological pecking order. But now this puzzler. Why, as we find ourselves at the dawn of the 21st century, do we seem to be facing a veritable invasion of these tiny creatures? Not by one species, but many. Why here, and why now, are we experiencing a sudden attack of some of the most destructive and deadly bugs and insects ever to crawl the earth? Experts have issued a dire warning. The surge of certain insect populations constitutes a global health threat that will affect worldwide populations for the next 20 years. What has caused the rise of this unexpected peril? Can we blame it on the birds and the bees? Or have humans actually constructed some of the world's most deadly plagues? Is this nature's human population control system at work? Or could it be that man's own sinister hand is at the controls of this deadly phenomena? Is it possible there are ancient predictions and religious prophecies that explain what all of this means? Recently, many of the world's smallest inhabitants have proved themselves to be deadly and destructive, and they appear to be getting more so. Is there some identifiable reason we are now in the midst of a lethal insect and virus invasion that many experts fear is impossible to stop? We'll look at the chilling possibilities in just a moment. And in part two of this episode, for more than 30 years, the world has witnessed the mystery of the crop circle. The often beautiful but always baffling markings appearing in farmers' fields all over the planet. Is it really possible for the increasingly complex crop circles to be the work of hoaxers? Can these complicated designs be constructed in just a matter of a few hours in complete darkness? Have recent crop circles revealed a tantalizing glimpse of their origin and even suggest, as some believe, that we have, in fact, made the long-awaited contact? The surprising answer in part two of this episode. But for now, let's examine the possibility of a plague of deadly insects. We all go through life accepting what textbooks told us about the universe. But what happens when questions are raised about many of our fundamental beliefs? A mystery that cannot be explained. An enigma that defies reason. A surprising and unexpected answer. To encounter such a mystery firsthand may change your life forever. Face to face with the greatest riddles of the ages, the world's most profound mysteries reach out and touch your life in ways you've never imagined possible. Encounters with the Unexplained. In the latter half of the 20th century, many scientists thought the world's most infectious diseases were under control. But it now appears that not only are old ailments re-emerging, but newer ones are blossoming into full-blown epidemics, many of them spread by lowly but deceptively dangerous insects. Typically, they come out of the night to attack their victims in a quest for blood. While that may sound like a description of Count Dracula, what we're talking about, in fact, is a deadly, real-life bloodsucker, the mosquito. Some disease-causing microbes are transmitted to humans by the air that we breathe or contact through our skin by the water that we drink or touch, or by the foods that we eat. Another group of microbes is transmitted or vectored to humans by members of the animal kingdom, frequently by insects. These types of illnesses are known as vector-borne diseases. Historically, these diseases have included malaria, yellow fever, typhus, and plague. The current undisputed king of vector-borne death is the mosquito. It has probably killed more human beings throughout history than any other animal. What they bring to your summer picnic is more than a little irritating itch. They also carry malaria, yellow fever, dengue, and several types of encephalitis. These diseases were once quite common in the United States. They've largely disappeared due to screening, sanitation, air conditioning, and organized mosquito control programs. 
In terms of raw numbers and deaths, malaria is the worst disease transmitted by mosquitoes. Since it was first identified in the early 20th century, billions have been infected by it and tens of millions have died from it. Has it been defeated by modern medicine? Not by a long shot. Currently, outbreaks of malaria occur in all of Central and South America, throughout the Middle East, in China, India, Southeast Asia, and the Philippines. It is the second largest killer in Sub-Saharan Africa after AIDS. The World Health Organization estimates there are 300 to 500 million clinical cases of malaria each year, resulting in between 1.5 and 2.7 million deaths. That's one death every 10 seconds. One of every 17 children dying this year will die from malaria. Of the four human types of malaria, one can be fatal, and there is another that stays in the body long afterwards and can produce recurring symptoms. There is no effective vaccination, and none likely in the years to come. Unfortunately, malaria is far from the only serious disease transmitted by the mosquito. One of the newly emerging and rapidly expanding illnesses spread by the insect is the West Nile virus. Few new illnesses have so quickly grabbed headlines and seized the attention of the medical community like this deadly disease. But how did it get to American shores? And how far will it spread? West Nile virus is the most geographically widespread disease of its kind. It's been detected on all continents that have temperate zones. First reported in Uganda in 1937, epidemics have occurred in Israel, the Balkans, Russia, and elsewhere. No one knows exactly how it arrived in the United States. Infected birds imported to American zoos, migrating birds, or stowaway mosquitoes. Once here, however, our mosquitoes then picked up the disease while birds dispersed it. Bird populations of crows, gulls, Pigeons, jays, and even red-tailed hawks were the first group of animals to be affected by this virus. Ironically, it's the birds that are responsible for spreading this disease. Certain birds, once infected, can allow the virus to multiply in their blood, making it easier for mosquitoes to acquire and spread to other birds, horses, and humans. When these birds migrate, they take the virus into new areas. When an uninfected mosquito bites the bird host, it picks up the virus and then spreads it to its next victim. It's not possible, however, to contract the disease from another animal, bird, or human being. Only mosquitoes do that dirty deed. West Nile virus made its first appearance in the United States in 1999. It has now been identified in 27 states in the District of Columbia and is spreading south to Florida, north to Ontario, Canada, and even east on Long Island. Currently spreading westward from Missouri and Arkansas, we now expect it to reach the Rocky Mountains and maybe beyond in 2002. The elderly, the chronically ill, and those with weakened immune systems are most at risk for developing and dying from the brain inflammation caused by West Nile virus. Let's turn to a more friendly insect. The honeybee has been known to produce a nasty sting occasionally, but by and large we have viewed them as friends, pollinating flowers and fruit trees and producing one of nature's true miracles, honey. In recent years, however, the image of the bee has been severely damaged by the presence of a distant cousin with a nasty temper, which some say was produced by humans interfering with their procreation process. It was the early immigrants and settlers in America who imported the honey-producing European bee that is now common in North America. These bees are easy to handle and produce large quantities of honey. Bees are responsible for pollinating many agricultural crops such as apples, melons, eggplants, peaches, pears, plums, prunes, avocados, and blueberries. In fact, a third of the food produced in the United States comes from plants that have been pollinated by honeybees. Since the introduction of the honey-producing bee into North America, things had been progressing nicely. Man and bee had settled into a mutually beneficial arrangement. Then, something happened. There had been attacks before, of course, and even an occasional death due to bee stings, usually the result of the victim's allergy to bee venom. But nothing like this. Suddenly, it seemed, death by swarming bees was big news, creating a wave of fear that became another burdensome worry of modern life. Again, why? And why here? Is there a sinister origin to this disturbing trend of killer insects? Or were these developments actually foreordained and predicted centuries ago? 
Has mankind tampered with nature to a point where nature has simply decided to fight back? Did we enlist germs and insects to fight our wars only to get caught in an uncontrollable backfire? What has become known as the killer bee problem first emerged in the Western Hemisphere in the 1950s. Agricultural specialists in Brazil went searching for a bee that would flourish in their country's hot tropical weather. They simply intended to breed a better producing honeybee. But things didn't quite work out that way. In 1956, geneticist Warwick Kerr, who was working on behalf of the Brazilian government, imported several colonies of African honeybees. He began breeding experiments to improve honey production of the local bees. However, a year later, 26 African queens escaped from his research lab, which was located about 100 miles south of Sao Paulo. These queens soon bred with the local bees. There were two surprises. First, the honey production from the Africanized honeybees was actually quite poor. Secondly, the hybrid bees took on the aggressive characteristics of their African ancestors. These bees soon became known as killer bees. These new bees look practically identical to European honeybees. In fact, the venom released in the sting from a killer bee is no stronger than that from a normal honeybee. Victims of the killer bee die due to the multiple stings delivered in their frenzied attack. It's not uncommon for a victim be it human or another animal, to be stung by these bees many hundreds of times. And the killer bees are more easily agitated than their European counterparts and respond in mass attacks. As a result of the escape of the poorly producing African honeybees, for all its good intentions and efforts, Brazil went from being fourth in the world in honey production to 27th by the early 1990s. Unfortunately, the killer bees began to move north at a rate of 50 to 200 miles per year. New colonies of bees steadily migrated up through South and Central America and into Mexico. The first colonies appeared in the United States in October of 1990 in Hidalgo, Texas. The vicious bees then colonized New Mexico and expanded into Arizona in 1993. That's the year the first death attributed to killer bees was reported in the U.S. Since tracking of the numbers was begun in 1956, it is believed the killer bees may have been responsible for 1,000 human deaths. Entomologists may have had good intentions, but the result has been uniformly bad. What's more, there doesn't appear to be a solution. Some scientists fear that the Africanized honeybee will be able to adapt to colder winters and eventually thrive throughout North America. Other tiny but deadly creatures have already proven that in spite of their size and inability to fly, they can also spread rapidly and efficiently. The sly little deer tick, purveyor of the dreaded Lyme disease, is one of these. Lyme disease is named after the Atlantic seaside town of Lyme, Connecticut, where in the mid-1970s, 51 residents came down with what at first appeared to be rheumatoid arthritis. Instead, turned out to be an inflammatory infection caused by bacteria that live in and are transmitted by deer ticks. The highest incident of Lyme disease is still found in the Northeast, but it is also common in the North Central states and on the West Coast, primarily in Northern California. In fact, occurrence of Lyme disease has increased 25-fold since surveys first began in 1982. So, just what are the medical implications of contracting Lyme disease. Although arthritis can develop in about 25% of patients, bringing pain and swelling to the large joints, it's much more common to develop numerous problems within the nervous system. These include numbness and tingling, the onset of Bell's palsy or paralysis of the facial muscles, along with severe fatigue, muscle and joint aches, and memory and mood problems. Symptoms can also include irregularities of the heart rhythm, meningitis, dizziness, twitches, and bowel problems. Most patients in the early stages of Lyme disease can recover quickly and completely when treated with antibiotics. The problem is Lyme disease can often be difficult to diagnose and many symptoms are frequently misdiagnosed as flu. Consequently, some infected people are diagnosed only after more severe symptoms set in. 
Further complicating the diagnosis, severe late occurring symptoms of the disease may not appear for weeks, months, or even years after the tick bite. Blood tests that can check for Lyme disease are not that reliable. Once the infection becomes chronic, it cannot be distinguished from other cases of chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. And there's another problem. Deer are now not the only carrier of the ticks. In most parts of the United States, Lyme disease is spread by the deer tick. However, the Lone Star tick can spread the disease in the lower Mississippi River Valley. They don't jump or fly. They wait on vegetation for an animal or human to brush against them. Then they attempt to reach the skin where they attach themselves by the mouth. Following a blood meal, the tick swells to two or three times its normal size, then drops to the ground. Lyme disease is the most common illness spread by ticks in the United States, and it can be treated with antibiotics, but we need better tests to help with the diagnosis of Lyme disease and more studies on how to best treat it. But the question remains, why this sudden and exploding infestation? So far as we know, unlike the killer bee, no one has been tampering with the tick population. Could it be that the history of the killer bee is a cautionary tale to help us bring into focus a long list of deadly results that can occur when man starts to manipulate the course of nature? The killer bee is, after all, a giant compared to some of the microscopic beasts that seem to be suddenly threatening human populations worldwide. Has man had a hand in this enigmatic rise in biological invasions? Dating as far back as World War I, combatant governments experimented with various chemical and biological means to achieve victory. The practice continued through World War II, through the Korean War, and on up to the present day. As current as today's headlines, there are concerns that insects and common household pests can be used to spread deadly diseases as a means of terrorist activity. From the use of mustard gas in World War I to Agent Orange in Vietnam, governments are continually experimenting with unconventional means to win on the battlefield and beyond. Both Germany and Japan had biological warfare divisions during World War II, and like scientists in their nuclear and rocket programs, foreign biological warfare experts were brought to the United States and the Soviet Union after the war so that we and the Soviets could learn their secrets. Unfortunately, there are indications that someone or even perhaps some government is resorting once again to the threat of biological destruction. It is now generally conceded that the anthrax spores that have been sent through the mail in the United States are the product of some highly sophisticated laboratory, probably in one of the wealthier nations and quite likely right here in the United States. This is just the latest in a long list of biological inventions developed on a global scale for purposes of warfare or, more frighteningly, for population control. Unfortunately, once the genie is out of the bottle, there's no way to put it back. And so far, there's no way to confine it. Anthrax does exist in nature and normally doesn't affect humans except in very rare instances. Unfortunately, it can be manufactured in a laboratory. And that seems to be the kind of anthrax we're seeing. But what about the other global plagues? In spite of extensive propaganda to the contrary, neither the HIV virus nor the Ebola virus has yet been found to have a natural source. Where did they come from? These and other deadly viruses are the invention of biomedical research run amok. Not only is it impossible to control the spread of these invisible monsters, so far it has proven impossible to provide either prevention or an antidote. Just like the killer bees, once turned loose, it becomes your worst nightmare. Biological warfare was and is considered so horrible that it has been banned by all civilized nations. Yet during the Gulf War, the specter was raised once again, and it's with us today in the threat of bioterrorism. No nation has yet admitted to the deliberate use of biological agents against either military or civilian populations, but the idea that terrorists might do so remains a frightening prospect. And adding to the fear is the knowledge that it would be frighteningly easy to do. Hopefully the states that sponsor terrorism, and even the terrorists themselves, know that once these agents are loose, their own populations become targets. As we have already learned, insects and viruses do not respect borders or boundaries of any kind. And neither bombs, bullets, nor billions of dollars can halt the global devastation that will ensue. The growing concerns about deadly insects have been associated by some people with recorded biblical passages and warnings. Is it possible that ancient religious texts have actually predicted the current alarming trend? The Bible contains many passages dealing with plague-like infestation of various bugs and insects. 
Usually they are considered acts of divine intervention, while the precise cause and cure of these ancient plagues is a matter of one's belief and faith. The sheer volume of reference in the biblical text of these events is impressive. Along with earthquakes and famine, Luke 21 talks about pestilence as one of the fearful events and great signs from heaven. Bugs are sent by God as a plague in Exodus 8:16. When Moses' staff struck the earth, God sent out untold numbers of gnats and flies to swarm the Pharaoh's palace and all of Egypt. In Bible passages specifically dealing with the last days, or so-called end times, pestilences are prophesied to become common throughout the world. Whether or not one takes these events as a sign of the end times, the sheer volume and magnitude of what's taken place cannot be dismissed or ignored. Some insect-borne diseases are still affecting only a relatively few victims, but the trend is alarming and the numbers are only going up. The geographical areas of possible infection are getting larger every year, and no long-term or large-scale preventatives or cures are on the immediate horizon. Meanwhile, viruses of suspicious origin are also spreading, and in some parts of the world decimating entire populations. What can be done to reverse this trend? Sadly, no one knows for certain, but vigilance and awareness should be high on everyone's list. Coming up in part two of this show, the remarkably complex and beautiful configurations known as crop circles. Not only have this cryptic phenomena persisted for decades, but the questions now being raised cut to the very heart of the controversy. What exactly is the origin of these amazing formations, and who or what is responsible for making them? Two new chapters of this inquiry have begun to unfold in dramatic fashion. First, an amazing eyewitness account of a crop circle actually being formed. And second, the discovery of two crop circles that have a chilling connection to a message beamed into distant space by Earth scientists nearly 30 years ago. Even the most serious researchers of crop circles acknowledge that over the years, hoaxers have had their hands in many of the 10,000 total reported crop circles, probably since the days of the earliest discoveries. Is it possible then that solid scientific support for the claims of authenticity by crop circle investigators has finally and fully ended the debate? How many hours it can take an unknown number of hoaxes to create one of the large and elaborate crop circles can be long debated unless they want to let us in on their secrets. However, what they cannot replicate is some of the chemical and biological abnormalities that we've detected in some of the genuine crop circles. The classic evidence found in the grain of genuine crop circles includes the presence of elongated nodes, expulsion cavities and germination abnormalities. These represent specific irrefutable changes at a cellular level that cannot be forged by hoaxers stomping crops with wooden planks. The disbelievers and skeptics have never been able to explain away what science has indisputably and consistently proven. Another puzzling aspect of the crop circle phenomenon has been the frequent appearance of lights above and near many of the sites. Glowing orbs would sometimes be present, and even more frequently, they would appear in photographs taken at the crop circle locations without having appeared to the naked eye. It is the lights that play an important role in the extraordinary experience of an eyewitness to one of the most remarkable recent crop circle experiences on record. Nancy Talbot is no novice to the world of crop circles. She is a co-founder of BLT, an investigative research team that includes biophysicist William C. Levengood, whose breakthrough scientific testing procedures have set the standard for evaluating plants affected by the crop circle phenomenon. Nancy Talbot's amazing and unique experience occurred during a research trip to Holland in the summer of 2001. I was there on behalf of Dr. William Roll, the uh, Parapsychological Services Institute, doing some geomagnetic and electromagnetic work uh, at a site where we have a lot of crop circles and an individual who seems to uh, anticipate their coming. 
I don't know if it's possible for a person to will a crop circle into being. There are many groups who have meditated on particular designs and later found them in the fields. But more interestingly are unconscious thoughts of crop circles where people have either driven by a hillside where there is no crop circle and they get an idea of what they'd like to see there. And the next day when they drive by, there it is. On August 8th, Nancy went to visit Robert Vanderbroek, who lived near the city of Hoven. The primary reason to be in southern Holland was to study more closely a young man there. His name is Robert, who for many years now has had dreams uh, of crop circles occurring in his area. A situation which has uh, often resulted in people going to the area, the field which he has seen in this dream, and there in fact will be uh, a new crop circle. For the first 10 days in Holland, Robert and Nancy visited a number of crop formations which had occurred in the area prior to her arrival. They were gathering the baseline data for Dr. Roll's research. During the nights, they bicycled out to the fields with a night vision camcorder and several flash cameras in order to carry out photographic experiments. It has been discovered that very unusual light phenomena often appear on these photographs, balls of light, but sometimes flashes or dribs or drabs of light, which we don't think we can explain uh, by any sort of camera malfunction or film glitch. On the night of the 20th, uh, I had been in Holland by about two weeks by this time, and we had spent the days uh, with the magnetometers out in the various crop circles that had occurred, taking measurements, and every night until three o'clock in the morning doing flash photography or other work in the uh, crop circles. And I was exhausted. Uh, Robert wanted to know if we were going out again, and in disgust I pretty much said, no, I'm going up to bed, and did so, leaving Robert down in the kitchen. Once I got upstairs, I pulled these curtains, thin gauzy curtains in front of the windows, got into my nightgown and got into bed to read for a while. Within about three minutes, I heard an intense, raucous bawling coming from some cows in a nearby barn. But the cattle soon quieted down and Nancy went back to her reading. At about 3.10, the cattle started to bawl again, this time louder, uh, clearly in distress and I realized again that perhaps I should get up and go to the windows so that I could uh, see whatever this was that was happening. Some intuition kept me in the bed. I didn't get up. I would say that maybe three minutes elapsed after that and then all of a sudden out of nowhere this brilliant white slightly bluish around the edges tube or column of light descended with enormous force down to the ground. It lit up my bedroom like uh, daytime. The outside was so bright I could see the trees across the field. Then everything went quiet, it was dark. Uh, as if nothing had happened at all. I almost wasn't sure I'd seen it. Uh, but within another second, another tube, another column of light descended, again with this incredible force, extremely difficult to explain the energy that was involved there came crashing down to the ground and again it lasted for a second or so and then it went dark. By this time I was starting to think of Robert wondering if he was seeing the same thing downstairs and before I could get out of the bed a third column came crashing down almost in exactly the same location. Again the outside lit up, again my room lit up. By now I was yelling for Robert uh, who was downstairs in the kitchen watching the same thing and I could hear him yelling for me uh, <laughs> about the same event. Everybody immediately went to the uh, windows at the back of the house to look up to see where these lights had come from, you know, what was up there, and there was absolutely nothing. They were separated from the farmer's field by a fence and a deep irrigation ditch. Just over the fence, about 15 feet into the field, just barely visible in the darkness, was a new crop circle. Nancy's desire to experience the phenomenon in a more direct way was fulfilled beyond her wildest expectations. But what, in fact, had they just seen? There wasn't a hint as to where the light had come from, yet the tangible, physical result of the effect of the light was just a matter of a few yards away. What would a close-up inspection of the field in daylight reveal? 
Had they just witnessed the true source of authentic crop circles in action? The thought of sleep was completely gone as Nancy and Robert pointed their flashlights out into the field. There were no hoaxers anywhere about. No students with elaborate plans, no men from the local pub with a board attached to one foot, nothing. The question was, would they find the markers they had come to expect when true crop circles were formed? I grabbed the flashlight and as we got to the fence at the back of the house, I, sh I turned it on and when I put it on the field there, about 10, maybe 15 feet into the field was a brand new 35 foot ellipse uh, staring at us back from the dark. Half of the leaves were laid in one direction and half were laid in the other and so we got a strange, uh, an odd reflection but we could clearly see this brand new crop circle in the string bean field. The next morning when I got up to my absolute amazement I could see this brand new crop circle from the bed itself. We got up and immediately went to the circle where we found a 35 foot long ellipse rather than a circle off of which, to the north, went a long pathway and a crossbar like the capital letter T. The bean plants were swept counterclockwise along the northern edge of the ellipse and then laid in one continuous sweep all along the southern edge. The eastern and western edges of the ellipse were slightly squared off, ending in rows of beans on either side, and the standing plants in the rows were completely unaffected. Examination of the plants showed them all to have been bent over at the base and no broken or split stems were seen. There was no visible trauma to the stems or leaves or the very healthy looking beans beneath them. The night after the crop circle formed, uh, Robert and I and a friend of his went back into the field to take some uh, night flash photography. Uh, we had thought we might get some of these orbs or other figures, other light phenomena on the film. Every roll of film that we took that night had uh, photographic anomalies. Some of them were large, semi-transparent orbs that seemed to be some distance away from us and the camera. Others were much smaller, much more dense, and very close to the people who were also in the shots, sometimes directly over their heads, sometimes down low next to the crop surface. Crop circle research uh, involving a study of clay minerals in soils at crop circles indicates the presence again of energies which have been suggested by the plant work earlier on. One of the studies proposed now is an attempt to duplicate these energies or at least some of them and in talking to microwave and laser experts about setting up these experiments they have voiced the opinion that the crop circles are probably the result of either military or industrial research uh, that has either gone astray, an accident so to speak, uh, where the, the fields then get impacted with the energies, or that they're actually playing with the citizenry by bouncing these energies off of satellites or perhaps from high-flying, high-altitude aircraft. One of the scientists involved in the most recent soil project uh, came to the opinion that we might be looking at uh, an energy, a new energy or an energy unknown to science at this point in time. And one of the most interesting ideas that I've come up with since this experience was the possibility that this energy or energy complex is actually interacting with human consciousness. The fact is that not 15 minutes after I had stated the disgust and the uh, frustration over the elusiveness of the phenomenon, the difficulty in studying it, this, uh, these tubes of light and the circle appeared. Not only did they appear, they did so in the closest field to my location, not more than 90 feet away from me, and entirely visible from the very bed that I was sleeping in. Nancy Talbot and the hundreds of dedicated researchers like her have already proven the reality of the crop circles to their own satisfaction. But the quest for the origin of these magical, mysterious formations continues and takes us next to Great Britain. There in the countryside of Chilbolton in the summer of 2001, there appeared two astounding crop circles. Could they be, as some researchers believe, nothing less than a message representing contact from an extraterrestrial civilization. 
Is it possible that they are in fact a scientific reply to a long distance call sent into space decades ago? Many researchers now believe that's exactly what occurred in the late summer of 2001. But the origins of this astounding celestial connection go back to the year 1974. This was an amazing and challenging undertaking. Imagine the task trying to formulate a message that you can send via radio telescope that will go out to someone who can't even understand English and even comes from another planet. The message was designed to be sincere, straightforward and non-threatening, a form of simple hello from planet Earth. It was the first message sent with the express intention of communicating with an alien civilization somewhere. Devising this message became a task for a small group of academics at Cornell University, led by Frank Drake and the late Carl Sagan. The message would be beamed into deep space from a 300-meter dish built into a mountain by the National Science Foundation at Arecibo, Puerto Rico, the most advanced radio telescope of the day. But in facing such a daunting task, just how do you decide what to put into the message, and in what form do you send it? Early on, the Cornell scientists made two basic assumptions. One, if there was a distant civilization capable of receiving and decoding a basic message, that civilization had to be, at minimum, somewhat scientifically advanced. The second assumption was that if there was anything close to a universal language among scientifically advanced civilizations, it would have to be the language of mathematics. The message devised by Drake and Sagan took the form of a cleverly devised binary sequence. This Morse code-like message had to be easily recognisable by any alien scientist as being a message and not just the random noise of space. The Arecibo message that was eventually sent showed that our numbering system on Earth used a base of 10. This then became the means to deciphering the rest of the message. Another part of the coded message identified the atomic numbers for hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and phosphorus, these being the most commonly occurring elements on our planet, the building blocks of human existence. Also included in the transmission was the molecular composition of human DNA, along with a depiction of the double helix DNA strand. The radio message also transmitted information about the human race, such as our form, the average height of humans, and also the population of Earth when the message was sent. One of the controversial inclusions in the message was the identification of our solar system as having nine planets, and that this message was originating on the third planet from our Sun, the star at the centre of this solar system. The problem that some scientists had, along with government and military officials, was that of a security risk, in that if we transmit a message out into space, we don't know who's going to pick it up, be they a friend or a potential foe. Anyone can decode the message and possibly even come to visit. On November the 16th, 1974, the Arecibo message, consisting of 1,679 pulses of binary data, was transmitted into space and took a little under three minutes to transmit. This signal was repeated a number of times over the next few days. The message was aimed at what was thought to be our best hunch, a star cluster called M13, which consists of 300,000 stars in the constellation of Hercules. The Arecibo message was later transmitted on several more occasions. Also, a gold-plated plaque displaying a similar message was affixed to Pioneer 10 and 11, the first two NASA scientific spacecraft, whose trajectories would carry them beyond our solar system into unknown space. The burning question being asked 27 years after the first Arecibo transmission was, have we, in fact, now received a reply in the form of a crop circle in the English countryside? In the intervening years, crop circles have become increasingly complex and have even contributed to new geometric theorems. Had someone, somewhere out there, received the message and created a response? Not all crop circles are discovered right away. And the fact is, they are hardly ever expected to be related, even if they appear in adjoining fields. But all that changed in August of 2001. Astronomers in the Chilbolton Radio Observatory were looking right out their front windows at what appeared to be binary code laid down in the wheat field. And only five days before 
on August 14th. They had seen a shadow out in the field and nobody had looked to see what it was. But by August 20th, with this binary code staring them in the face, so to speak, through the windows of the observatory, phone calls went out, people went up in airplanes, and what they saw startled everyone. The Chilbolton Radio Telescope Complex was built in 1965, originally funded by Cornell University, the same institution where Carl Sagan and Frank Drake devised the Arecibo message. The facility is situated adjacent to privately owned lands and is surrounded by a high barbed wire fence. The crop markings were easily visible from the Chilbolton complex. It was far from an ideal location for any hoaxers to secretly carry out the making of two complex crop formations during the brief nighttime hours of summer. And what did investigators make of the markings? Was there evidence within the formation that suggested an extraterrestrial origin? This is what was in the field out in front of the observatory. And this is what astronomers from Cornell University prepared to send out in binary code from the Arecibo radio observatory down in Puerto Rico on November 16, 1974. A close examination showed that the two code formations were only similar, but not the same. So what were the significant differences of the patterns in the Chilbolton crop formation compared to the 1974 Arecibo transmission concerning the message's planet of origin? Well, as you come up into where we had a solar system showing our sun over to the third planet is raised up, third planet from the sun Earth, and we put a little humanoid figure up there and we indicated how high it was in the population. You come over into the photograph of the field in August of 2001 and here's the square for the sun. You come over two planets and the third planet, the fourth planet, the fifth planet are all raised as we did in our 74 transmission, indicating perhaps that something is saying we have three planets inhabited somewhere. And what about the human figure represented in the original Arecibo code? How has the Chilbotan code responded to that part of the message? You come to the same position that we indicated a human, and over here it is very odd. If this is a head, it's much, much larger than a human head, and it seems to indicate some kind of arms, a torso and legs, but with a completely different layout compared to us. Ultimately, there are two overriding questions. Have tricksters with PhD levels of knowledge about cellular biology pushed crop circle hoaxing far beyond previous levels of sophistication? Or have we finally seen the face of alien contact? Meanwhile, the investigation continues into the amazing pair of crop formations found at the beginning of the 21st century near the Chilbolton Observatory. For the ultimate answer, we can only look to the heavens and watch for new messages in the fields.